Um, to start us off, um, so first, welcome to the first session of the Great Lakes Traditional Ecological Knowledge Speaker Series. To begin, I would like to welcome Sati Okwa Baktooth to deliver the opening address for the series. Sati Okwa serves as a traditional ecological knowledge consultant for the St. Regis Mohawk tribe, and she is also the founder of Snipe Clan Botanicals. a <laughs> Hadi ne kahve cazesin onu cihun cadde. Etonya dört niyam kani gula. 
Scotty <laughs> Ona Enaka Nanji to a gale at the Nelji stop part so a Nedayatino Holado and Sultanes for your tigas. Yoko Diana was a donut Yoko Gat da Salonia da for name, he said to Galapa. The hoodie swatted to only Gina Elu Awayast and Escana Jacob do her dandy Gina Hodas and Guyan Toy. Etonia Dot near Guatnigula. Muscatia and the dwarf at Nuni no Guatnigula done at the Tin Holado and Nedjini Gayalo and the Lehundel and Dat Nigula Lanaka Hujula Gayalo, the Dosatana and Nadala, Swaxa, a whole another way out to Nedjun Kia Hialapa. Etonia Dot near Guatnigula. On a noe noe at the Dawawani, Nani Halatne, Nedjinua, to the Danak de Laguan in a Sanguay at Dizon. A Guego I knew any Gawain on the Gasat Stansal at Sul and then a Guego the Hot Kamahage. Jinu hold an escana, I don't know the new hugget in Galee with some jagger dame, what the woman. On on, did what the way on to a new way, under what the one I yell at the easy not going and do him, and did what got when I can hold a dunsala, a tonya dog, me what Nigula. On I know a head to a win a yo yo hair, owns a gilly one, who don't go, Jinu hold dancer with the one not doing you. Yaki, they ain't got any go, they will get any go home, need to get no hold ducks and get any go, huh? She's away at that soon getting their honor, but will he find that one is what got when I can hold a dunsala. Uh, so, Segal, everybody. Uh, my name is Satya Yogla. I'm Snipe Clan from Akwazasne, and I just uh, opened up our um, our matters for today. The Ohantagaliwa Dekma is known as the, the translates to the words that come before all else. It's to help bring our minds together. Um, everybody in here has. Um, some, some things, responsibilities that might distract them, whether you're worried about your kids doing work or what they'll do after school, or if you have a deadline or in the future, it brings all our minds to the present. And it reminds us that we're all dependent on these things in, in nature that we go through. And so we start with um, opening it up and acknowledging us as the people that we um, are hopeful that we're still that there's still peace between us and then we move to our mother earth that she still carries and provides um, everything that sustains us um, then we move into the waters the different types of waters the rivers the lakes the creeks the ponds the rains the dew that we still find clean water to quench our thirst uh, we move to the fish that we continue to see them and that they provide us food and clean water. The grasses that they still grow as far as the eye can see. Um, some are food, some are medicines. The medicines that they still support us and carry our sickness far away and that they support us, our bodies. The various food plants that we still find in the wild and that we still plant our gardens and find our traditional seeds, um, the corn, beans, and squash, uh, the three sisters. Then we move to the fruits that it's joyful. We still see the wild fruits growing, um, the strawberries and blueberries and raspberries. Um, the raspberries are, I'm sorry, the strawberries are the leaders of the plants. They're the first to blossom in the summer, which will be coming up soon. Um, then we move on to the animals that we still see them roaming along our, um, in the yards and in the woods, um, that they still continue to provide our sustenance and clothing. Uh, the trees that they continue to grow, provide us warmth in the winter and shade in the summer. 
the birds that we still see them flying overhead and we can still hear their beautiful songs each day that bring us peace. The thunders that we still hear their rumble and they continue to come every season and clean our waters. The four winds that they um, blow and clean the air that we breathe. Um, the, our brother, the sun that he comes up every day provides us warmth and sunlight that gives us strength. Our grandmother, the moon, moon, that she connects all the women on the earth and the push and pull of her, her waters um, or has an effect on the water and that she continues to watch over our young. And the stars that they help brighten, help our grandmother moon brighten the night sky and they help mark our way if we are ever to get lost. And they also, help our gardens by leaving dew drops in the mornings. The four beings that they continue to watch over our families and remind us of how we should live and our creator for making everything on earth that helps us survive. And now I've opened today's matters and I hope we have a great, fantastic event. Niamakoa. Mm. Miigwech. Thank you, Sati Okwa, for your beautiful and grounding opening address to help us initiate the speaker series in a, a good way. Buju, Anin, Anishinaabe Kwe, Naganiko Kwe, Ziguan Kwe, Jinakaz, Nikikindo Dem, Wikwe Dong, and Dunjaba. Hello, my name is Jessica Kaski. I am Anishinaabe from the Kiwana Bay Indian community located in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Today I am participating from Dakota Homelands in Minnesota, where I serve as a regional biologist and program manager for the Bureau of Indian Affairs, also as the US co-lead for the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement and Extend Science Traditional Ecological Knowledge Task Team. The Great Lakes TEK series seeks to connect and share lessons across communities and increase awareness of the value of indigenous knowledge and how how to appropriately bridge knowledge systems. The series is presented by Annex 10 of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement in partnership with the University of Minnesota Twin Cities Department of American Indian Studies. Is co Andrew Preston, who serves as the Canadian co-lead for the TK task team, and TK task team member Jessica Dolan, who serves as an ethnobotanist on contract with the St. Regis Mohawk tribe in Aquasasne and is also a member of the Conservation Through Reconciliation team based out of the University of Guelph in Ontario. Um, so now I will pass it over to um, our other co-organizer, Andrew Preston, to introduce himself and provide some logistics for today. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Andrew Preston. I am coming to you from uh, Anishinaabe Haudenosaunee Territory, Dish with One Spoon, Territory, Treaty Territory of the Mississaugas is of uh, Credit, First Nation. Very pleased to be here uh, with you today. I'm a Senior Policy Analyst with Environment and Climate Change Canada. And as Jessica mentioned, I'm the co-lead of the Great Lakes Water Quality Annex 10 uh, TEK Task Team. Before getting started today, just uh, a couple of housekeeping items. First, in terms of how the session will unfold, we're gonna be having two presentations, each approximately 20 minutes in length. Following these two presentations, we'll move into the question and answer portion of the program. And there we'll have approximately uh, 20 minutes for questions. To pose your questions, we'd like you to use Zoom's Q&A function. You should see that button, uh, the button for that at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we're gonna be collecting questions as they're posted throughout the presentations. Uh, and then we'll return to them during the Q&A portion. So please go ahead and submit uh, your questions as you think of them rather than waiting for the Q&A segment to begin. Uh, if you wanna post any other information to the larger group, please use the chat function. And finally, I'd like to introduce the series moderator, Michael Dockery. Mike is a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation with traditional territories around Southern Lake Michigan. He is an assistant professor for tribal natural resource management in the forest resources department and an affiliate faculty member in American Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota. Mike, over to you. Great, thank you. Miigwech, everybody. Bozo, Denwe Makna, Kwabmet, and Dijnikas. 
I'm Mike Dockery. It's so wonderful to be here with you all. Um, I am just amazed um, by the number of folks and looking at all the different territories and tribal nations that we come from. It's just, it's just amazing. Um, so thank you very much for having me here. I'm gonna introduce our speakers uh, now, and then we will get into uh, presentations as Andrew mentioned. Um, and then we will have time for question and answer. Um, and I'll just reiterate, if you could use the question and answer function to post your comments, that'll help us organize it. With this many people, it's difficult to, uh, to, to kind of organize the question part of it. So we really appreciate that. Okay, here we go for the introductions. Um, first, uh, our first speaker is uh, Jen Vanader. Uh, Jen is an attorney at the Great Lakes uh, and the Great Lakes Program Coordinator within the Division of Intergovernmental Affairs for the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission uh, in Odana, Wisconsin. In this role, she serves as the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, the GLWQA, TEK Task Team, uh, and she is, was a key author of a recently completed guidance document on TEK pursuant to the GLWQA, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. She's provided legal and policy analysis to Glyphwick and its member tribes for almost a decade, specializing in water quantity and quality issues and Lake Superior protection and restoration. Prior to that, Jen represented tribal governments in civil matters and federal courts, as well as on legislative and regulatory issues with the United States Congress and federal agencies. She received her undergraduate degrees in history and anthropology from Purdue University, a master's degree in environmental history from Northern Arizona University, and both a master's degree in environmental law and a Juris Doctorate from uh, Vermont Law School. Our second speaker today is Neil Jones. Neil Jones is a senior policy advisor in the Indigenous Affairs and Reconciliation Directorate at Environment and Climate Change Canada. Neil is Anishinaabe from Garden River First Nation, just east of Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. While working with Environment and Climate Change Canada, he has worked with Aboriginal representatives on guidance for the use of Aboriginal traditional knowledge in Species at Risk Act processes. He has also worked on indigenous engagement and consultation related to the Fisheries Act. And with that short introduction, I would like to um, invite uh, Jen to start her presentation. And then afterwards, we will go to Neil. Again, if you have questions, please put them in Q&A. So welcome, Jen. All right, good afternoon. Thank you for that introduction. While I share my screen. All right, so I am uh, Jen Vanatter, and I am here to provide a brief talk about the TEK guidance document that was drafted and released by the U.S. Caucus of the Traditional Ecological Knowledge Task Team under the Science Subcommittee of the Great Lakes Executive Committee under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, otherwise known as the TEK Task Team of the Annex 10 Subcommittee. Okay, so here is a roadmap for the talk today. Um, it is important to note that this guidance document, document was drafted to fill a very specific space. It was drafted to help guide those who are during, doing work under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreements on ways in which TEK can be bridged um, with Western science within the very specific mandates of the agreement itself. And since this is so specific, I will take a quick tour through the Great Lakes Water Quality, what the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement is, as well as where the US Caucus of the TEK task team fits within it. And then I will go into a little bit of a background as to why the task team created this specific document. Um, and then I will introduce you to the document itself, its purpose, its structure, and um, calling out the different methods on how different knowledge systems were bridged in science and management activities around the Great Lakes Basin. So first, what is the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement? The Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement was first signed in 1972 
as a commitment between the federal governments of the United States and Canada to protect and restore the waters of the Great Lakes. And it develops a framework for how the two federal governments should coordinate in achieving those commitments. The agreement has been updated a handful of times through the years with the most recent update occurring in 2012. The general commitments of the two federal governments is to work towards ensuring that the Great Lakes are swimmable, drinkable, and fishable. And all of the smaller and more specific goals within the agreement are designed to meet those commitments. I will say, however, that those benchmarks are very much defined by Western standards, and that matters when you talk about identifying a safety target. This is a fact that illustrates very clearly the importance of including indigenous knowledge systems under the auspices of the agreement. Safety targets look much different in com communities that fish for subsistence, ceremonial, or religious purposes than they do in sport fishing communities. And this is something we deal with on a regular basis. The federal government reports out about twice a year on the safety of eating Great Lakes fish, and they say that um, it's safe to eat the fish as long as consumption guidance is followed. And we argue with them every single time and say it's not safe to eat if you cannot consume the fish in the manner that meets your cultural subsistence and or ceremonial needs. But to get back to the agreement itself, um, to work towards those swimmable, fishable, and drinkable standards, the agreement established a framework of 10 annexes. Each annex is responsible for one broad issue area. So there are 10 issues on which the US and Canada agree to focus and they hope by doing so, they will meet those general commitments under the agreements. The implementation and coordination of the agreement is done through the US EPA, specifically Region 5 and Environment Climate Change Canada. Each of the 10 annexes has a subcommittee that is open to representatives from relevant governmental agencies from state, federal, tribal, provincial First Nation governments. These subcommittees are co-led by staff from the two federal governments, and they draft the actions that they see to be priorities to meeting their mandates under the agreement. The coordination of these subcommittees and their task teams make up the totality of the work being done under the agreement. So as you can see in the slide, in addition to the annex subcommittees, the agreement also calls for the existence of the Great Lakes Executive Committee, known as the GLEC. The GLEC is made up of senior level managers from agencies of all of the jurisdictions around the basin and co-chaired by U US EPA's Region 5 and the Regional Director General for Environment Climate Change Canada in Ontario. The official objectives of the GLEC are to cooperate and collaborate on the implementation of the agreement. In operation, it meets twice a year to hear reports by the subcommittee co-leads on work that has been completed over the previous six months and to have an opportunity to provide advice, criticisms, or guidance on that work. Um, in operation, um, lately, the, while the GLEC co-chairs sit over top the GLEC, um, which then sits over top the annex subcommittees, in operation lately, the 10 annex subcommittee co-leads, which are you know, federal staff of federal agencies, report directly up to the GLEC co-chairs, who then coordinate and communicating back down to um, the GLEC itself. And over the past several years, since the 2012 update, the amount of information actually flowing down to the GLEC has been minimal and increasingly delayed. So it's becoming increasingly important that interested governments or communities play a role in the subcommittees themselves. And so with that quick introduction, the slide will also show you the 10 annexes, the 10 focus areas um, on the focus areas that the uh, US and Canada agreed to focus on. Um, and I will fly through these really quickly to give you an idea of how Annex 10 and ultimately the TEK task team fits in. Annex 1 focuses on areas of concern. It is tasked with restoring impaired beneficial uses at AOCs through the development and implementation of remedial action plans for each designated AOC. Um, Annex 2 tries to coordinate all of these science and priority threats facing um, lakes on a lake by lake basis. Annex three focuses on chemicals of mutual concern. Specifically, this annex is tasked with identifying new chemicals in the waters of the Great Lakes that are concerning for human and wildlife health. Wildlife health, 
Um, these chemicals can be new, whether because we are just discovering them in the water or because we are just starting to recognize their impact on human wildlife or ecosystem health. And once a chemical is designated as a CMC, the subcommittee is tasked with developing chemo chemical specific strategies for dealing with those chemicals. Annex 4 is tasked with addressing phosphorus and other nutrients in the Great Lakes water, the waters of the Great Lakes. Annex 5 is meant to work on preventing harmful discharges from ships or other vessels. Annex 6 um, is to focus on preventing the introduction of new aquatic invasive species and limiting the impacts of those that already exist in the Great Lakes Basin. Annex 7 is to focus on conserving, protecting, maintaining, restoring, and enhancing the resilience of native species and their habitat, as well as to support essential ecosystem functions. Annex 8 is tasked with coordinating groundwater science and management actions. And Annex 9 is, addresses climate change impacts, specifically coordinating efforts to understand and predict the effects of climate change and to proactively address those impacts. And with all those nine annexes, you can see how much science is happening throughout um, the work being done under the agreement. And so that brings us to Annex 10, which is responsible for coordinating, integrating, and synthesizing all the science around the Great Lakes. And Annex 10 is where the TEK task team is housed. Um, so as I just stated, Annex 10 subcommittee is tasked with science coordination and integration on all the work being done under the agreements. It works to do that through the four bullets on the left, and each of those bullets is associated with a separate task team. The fourth bullet represents the TEK task team. So shortly after the 2012 update, um, we created the TEK task team, and we had a fairly broad charge, which was to support the inclusion of TEK into work being done under the agreement. Through many iterations of the task team, the US caucus has landed on the bullets on the right of the slide as representing the primary roles it sees itself playing to fulfill that larger charge within the context of the overall Annex 10 subcommittee. And so as you can see, those include providing guidance on how indigenous and Western knowledge systems can collaborate within the work being done under the agreement, helping the other annex subcommittees identify opportunities where TEK can enhance, guide, or otherwise collaborate with their work, compile a record of TEK related activities, studies, science, or management actions, to look for ways to increase the participation of indigenous people within the work of the annex subcommittees themselves, defining a way to measure whether there is an increase of awareness of TEK and if that TEK is showing up in the work under the agreement. And one thing that is not bulleted, but we are actively doing is compiling a repository of edu easily accessible educational resources on indigenous knowledge systems. It's also important to note what is missing from that list of roles. While we are working on compiling educational material to hopefully increase the information being shared about indigenous knowledge systems, the task team itself never saw itself as being responsible for the direct education on um, indigenous knowledge or TEK or those systems. And it's also important to make clear at this point that the TEK task team currently is only made up of a US caucus. So these roles may modify if and when it becomes a complete task team again. After the initial discussion on this guidance document, representatives from First Nations and the federal government of Canada withdrew while they hammered out some issues. Um, and so the guidance document I'm presenting today is also presented solely from um, the U.S. caucus. And I will say, I think we are pretty close to getting a full task team up and running again. Um, so now we'll start with the overview of the document itself. Um, and we'll, we will start with the purpose of the document. Once the TEK hammered, once the TEK task team hammered out the roles that it thought it could play to assist Annex 10 and its overall integration responsibilities, we had to decide what exactly our first step would be how would we want to support the cooperation and collaboration between different knowledge systems? Currently, the work being done under the agreement is almost wholly based on Western science from priority setting to monitoring to management decisions, et cetera. And this brand new task team had to decide what would be the most useful first step in supporting TEK within a structure that is not necessarily designed for it 
and that is overseen by people that might have little to no prior interaction with TEK. So after res wrestling through several decision points, we decided that the most useful first step would be to produce a guidance document. And we decided that this document should represent an initial step to introducing TEK to the jurisdictions working under the agreement and to demonstrate how TEK has already collaborated um, with Western Knowledge Systems and how it can collaborate within the structure that is already in place. So with that in mind, the first half of the document provides a very elementary introduction to TEK. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we wanted, when we thought the best way to introduce TEK to um, those who are strongly rooted in a Western knowledge system and have very little to no interaction with indigenous knowledge systems, or maybe even little to no interaction with indigenous communities, was to create an elementary introduction, something that wasn't so complex that they shelved it and didn't read it, or that they were um, too intimidated to use or to pursue further. But we did, as part of that decision, um, we did discuss ensuring that this document was a living one that could be added to and um, improved over time. And the document also provides in it, one of its annex or one of its um, appendices a, a fairly comprehensive list of additional resources that can be accessed to learn more about TDK. And then the second half of the document provides examples of ways in which indigenous and Western knowledge systems have already interacted around the Great Lakes Basin. Tribes and intertribal agencies have undertaken coordination between the knowledge systems for several years. And because that coordination either happens within tribes or on a small scale, other jurisdictions may not have an understanding that it occurs at all or how it can occur or when. And we also discovered that for many of the activities and decisions around the Great Lakes Basin, this coordination already tended to fall within the frameworks of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement or domestic Great Lakes program. So it was easy to pull out a few examples to provide guidance in this document. Um, and by presenting these examples in this document, we are hoping it can spark some brainstorming in other jurisdictions on um, the best ways that indigenous knowledge systems and Western science systems can um, collaborate in Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement work. So this slide presents a snapshot of the guidance documents introduction to TEK. And first the document acknowledges that tra traditional ecological knowledge is just one element of indigenous knowledge. Indigenous knowledge encompasses environmental, socioeconomic, cultural, and other elements of overall knowledge. And while TEK cannot truly be separated from indigenous knowledge, we use this term in the document because it is um, the most widely recognized element of indigenous knowledge because we are dealing with the ecological aspect of science and management within the Great Lakes and because it is the term that is used in the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement itself. And secondly, the document recognizes that TEK encompasses not only the knowledge systems held by disparate indigenous communities, but also the underlying beliefs and relationships. So in this document, we, again, a very elementary introduction to de the definition of TEK, we define it as commonly recognized to be based upon rela relations with one another in the natural world, including direct environmental observations, connections, and interactions that are customarily transmitted interpersonally and orally from generation to generation. TEK is intrinsically linked to spiritual beliefs, cultural practices, and ways of life, and encompass the whole being, the mind, spirit, and emotion. TEK teaches that both water and what the Western knowledge systems call natural resources have rights and require reciprocity and respect. And TEK is a significant source of inspiration to inform environmental values, norms, and ethics. We also make clear that if an indigenous entity, person, or persons share information for contribution to work being done under the agreement, that information must be respected and acknowledged in a way that is deemed appropriate by um, knowledge holder or holders. So this one way we thought, it, oh, I don't know how to go back. So I don't know how to go back. So the previous slide showed a diagram that showed the intersection of Western knowledge systems and TEK. We thought one of the most useful ways to 
introduce the definition of TEK to those grounded in Western knowledge systems was to compare and contrast with those Western knowledge systems. Um, there are many ways that this has been diagrammed um, and there, there, are, there are wonderful illustrations out there and they'd be easy to find. But um, this particular diagram shows, well, I'll start first with the common ground. Both, both Western and indigenous knowledge systems are based on a form of the scientific method. They operate through observations, experimentation, analysis, and conclusions. And where they differ is basically on application. Western science tends to operate on a broad scale when compared to TEK, which operates on a more localized scale. Western science focuses on averaging to infer trends on those broad scales, while TEK is gathered through long-term experience and interactions built upon generations of observational teaching and stories to infer trends at a more local and culturally specific scale. Western knowledge systems work to simplify and divide complexity by isolating discrete parts, while TEK is gathered through embracing that complexity and includes the recognition of the interconnected components that make up the ecosystem and that those components should not be divided. So now we're on this slide. Um, given, given the differences and similarities between TEK and Western science, the guidance document uses examples of how TEK has been utilized with regards to the science and management actions within the Great Lakes at different scales over the past several years. And while the document acknowledges the difficulty that can be inherent in coordinating between two different or many different knowledge systems, um, it hopes that by demonstrating the different ways these knowledge systems have been bridged already throughout the basin, it can help guide jurisdictions through those difficulties. So we tried choosing examples um, that mirror the annexes of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement to some extent to help illustrate the different ways in which um, the knowledge systems can be bridged by the annexes themselves. We have, six we have six examples in the document and six represented on these slides, but in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of pick and choose um, a few to focus on. So I will point out that the first example on this slide, AOC priority setting, will be covered in depth in the June 9th session in this talking series. So I'm going to, I think, skip that one and move on to lake-wide priority setting. So information, um, shared by community members can guide scientific research. Um, Buffalo Reef in Keweenaw Bay in Lake Superior is an important spawning habitat for lake trout and whitefish. In the late 1990s, tribal fishermen noticed a change in fish population and began to express concern about the health of the reef. The information that was provided by the tribal fishermen to the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission enabled Glyphwick to apply for and receive a grant from the US EPA that allowed them to obtain sonar imaging of the reef. And this imaging showed that the reef was being covered by stamp sands, mining waste that had been dumped into the lake and along its shoreline during the area's mining area during the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, after several years of intertribal coordination and scientific analysis, the and 12 years of coordination of multiple state and federal jurisdictions, the Lake Superior Partnership was able to label the protection and restoration of the reef as a priority in the 2016 Lake Superior Lakewide Action and Management Plan, which is developed under Annex 2 of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. This was the final step that allowed support for cooperative efforts by the Keweenaw Bay Indian community, Glyphwick, Michigan Tech University, the Army Corps of Engineers, the EPA, the state of Michigan, and others to develop um, short-term dredging and disposal plans for stamp sands that already cover the reef and to create an interjurisdictional task force to work on long-term plans for protecting the reef. So in this example, years of intertribal information from community members led to directing scientific research and years of an intertribal collaboration on reef and fish populations provided the scientific data necessary to get the programs in place and the support to um, address the issue. Um, the chemicals of concern example, I believe that is going to be touched on in the July 16th session of the series. Um, so I'm going to beg off of that one too and skip on to the next slide. Um, we have 
Habitat Protection and Restoration. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration received GLRI funding to support the Newman restoration work in the Lake Superior Basin with tribal partners. NOAA reached out to tribal, state, and federal partners that work with Manuman to collaborate. And they held workshops in 2017, 2018, and 2019 to discuss the cultural significance of Manuman, the complexity of Manuman management, and the challenges for restoration. The first workshop produced a Manuman characterization study to help de develop guidance to inform Manuman man management, protection, and policy in the Lake Superior Basin and throughout the Great Lakes. A lot goes into this project that is better explained in the document itself, but I will end it by merely saying that this project, project integrated expertise of all partners involved. Um, NOAA focused on hyperspectral data collected and tribes brought restoration techniques and observa observations based on TEK. And I will, again, the climate change example is going to be addressed later in the speaker series. The exact date is escaping me right now. So going down to species management planning, um, from the early 2000s, staff from Glyphwick and the United States Department of Agriculture's Forest Inventory and Analysis, FIA program, have been working to incorporate TEK into targeted forest inventories to research the health, availability, and sustainability of forest paper birch in the Upper Great Lakes region of the United States. In the early 2000s, Glyphwick staff began to hear from its member tribes that harvesters were reporting increasing difficulty finding birch bark of sufficient quality to make canoes or crafts. Um, the harvesters and Glyphwick staff suspected this was the result of changing forest management practices in the region. Since Glyphwick and staff from the FAA, FIA program are already working together under a memorandum of understanding, they decided to collaborate on the design and implementation of a program to incorporate TEK into an inventory of birch bark characteristics in the Great Lakes region. They did so when Glyphwick staff identified harvesters from five of its member tribes who had decades of experience finding, choosing, harvesting, and using birch bark for multiple uses. Um, for a year, these harvesters shared information about suitable bark characteristics and strategies for finding and identifying bark that is necessary for their purposes. Glyphwick staff then synthesized this information and identified frequently mentioned character characteristics. Staff from Glyphwick and the FIA program then incorporated these characteristics into regional inventory protocol in such a way that it could be expressed in terms of discrete variables that could be assessed objectively by forestry professionals with no experience harvesting birch bark. The protocol was shared with tribal harvesters to make sure that the information was adequately and appropriately captured. It went into practice in 2004, um, but FIA program staff initially reported that there were difficulties in implementing part of the protocols, which led to a two-year editing process. But the result of the process was a manual that was effective for FIA program staff while still reflecting characteristics shared through TEK. Thanks for bearing with me. That's a lot of information for a short period of time. This is my contact information. If you want to contact me with any questions, um, you can also contact uh, Jessica Koski. And thank you very much. Miigwech, Jen, thank you so much. That was great. That was a wonderful introduction and um, really good examples here. Um, I want to just make a quick announcement. If you're typing things into the chat, You'll see right above where you type it, there's a little, um, it says two, and then there's a blue button that says either panelists or panelists and attendees. If you want everybody to see your chat, make sure that you click on that button and so it says panelists and attendees. Um, I realized maybe about half the folks that are putting their, maybe a little bit less than that, a third of the people putting in their uh, introductions and their territories where they're coming from, um, are just coming to the panelists, which is wonderful to see. And it's pretty, pretty amazing, like I said. But uh, if you want everybody to see it, please uh, make sure that it says panelists and attendees. Okay, with that, I'm going to pass the, um, pass the presentation over to Neil Jones, if you would like to unmute yourself and, and give your presentation and, and keep asking questions in the, in the question and answer um, box as well. That's really helpful. Thank you.
<clears throat> Hello everyone. I'm just looking to share my screen. This worked really well in rehearsal. Okay, uh, if that's worked, uh, then you'll see. Um, can someone just give me a bit of a thumbs up? That you can, you can... Yeah, Neil, we can see it, but you're not, you're still just, it's not actually presenting yet. So we see all the, it's not in presenter view yet. So if, I don't know if you want to click start the slideshow. Post the... <clears throat> Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, just a second here. Okay. I think I'm ready to go. <clears throat> okay. Um, thank you, Michael, for that introduction. And uh, thank you to the organizers of uh, this event. Hello. Uh, bonjour. Uh, Sego. Bonjour. And Anin. Uh, Neil Jones, that's because Ketagon ZB Donjaba. Uh, I would like to begin with an acknowledgement to my parents and all the elders and knowledge holders who have shared with me um, and, and taught me. Chime from uh, to them for their uh, time and patience. Uh, first, a uh, short note about the acronyms and short forms I will use, and I apologize in advance for that. Uh, I will uh, limit um, acronyms to uh, Instead of saying Environment and Climate Change Canada, I will say either ECCC or Environment Canada. For traditional environmental knowledge, uh, I'll say TEK or Tech. And for Indigenous knowledge, I may use IK. <clears throat> um, and uh, finally, I may say uh, simply the framework in reference to the Environment and Climate Change Canada Indigenous Knowledge Framework. Of course, in using those short forms, uh, no disrespect is intended. Uh, so then, um, this event provides an opportunity to share with viewers uh, the work Environment Canada is doing with respect to the, the development uh, of the framework. Uh, unlike uh, Jen's presentation, the framework, the, the guidance document is, uh, has not been released yet hasn't been completed and remains a work in progress. <clears throat> but it does reflect the direction uh, ECCC is going with respect to Indigenous knowledge uh, and working with Indigenous people. The focus of the framework is national in scope, but nonetheless is applicable to the Great Lakes region. Um, this is being presented for increasing awareness, but also to continue the dialogue on the development of the framework. <clears throat> so I invite uh, my uh, colleagues uh, in Canada uh, to send me an email uh, or anyone um, anywhere about uh, what's worked uh, in your regions and communities uh, in hopes that uh, we can make a better document. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay. Uh, as mentioned, development uh, of the framework is ongoing. So um, in the framework, a history is important uh, to increase awareness of the historical and legal developments that have led to where we are today. <clears throat> the framework is intended for use by all roughly 7,000 ECCC employees, uh, whether they are biologists, scientists, policy folks, legal folks, finance, comms, uh, and so on. Working with IK and Indigenous groups touches a lot of what Environment Canada does. Another reason for doing uh, this is that uh, the framework um, addresses one of the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which uh, states that um, uh, to inform Government of Canada employees about Indigenous people. Uh, next slide. Okay. <clears throat> um, oh, no, I went one slide too far. Uh, that's okay. Uh, I'll get to that one next. Um, so uh, basically in the previous slide, what I would have said was that uh, uh, to begin a reminder that uh, Indigenous knowledge uh, originates 
from Indigenous people in a particular place. So in Canada, the different types of Indigenous people, of course, are the First Nations, the Inuit, and the Métis people. Uh, what is Indigenous knowledge? A lot of um, Environment Canada folks have asked. Um, because uh, Indigenous knowledge is uniquely described by individual communities in their uh, regions or nations, thus uh, there can be a large variety in the way IK is described. For this reason, ECCC maintains that there is no nationally accepted definition of IK. Rather, IK is described or defined uh, by the Indigenous group in their own terms. Um, and uh, next, um, the framework um, is uh, in response to a number of pieces of legislation, uh, such as uh, the Mackenzie Valley Resource Management Act, Species Risk Act, Fisheries Act, Environmental Protection Act, Impact Assessment Act, and so on. Um, and a lot of these acts, uh, sorry, all of these acts mention in some form or another the inclusion of indigenous knowledge. Um, however, there is a variety, for instance, in the Impact Assessment Act, uh, it talks about how the assessments must take into account IK. Uh, the Fisheries Act says the minister may consider IK when making decisions. And in the Species at Risk Act, it says that Aboriginal traditional knowledge should be considered in the assessment of species. So uh, while there is inclusion, there isn't necessarily uh, agreement on the wording of that. Um, uh, there is a growing recognition of the importance of IK uh, in uh, beyond legislation into areas such as policy development, uh, science and uh, research. Recently, however, there is a uh, shift in the approach uh, to Indigenous knowledge. Um, in uh, years past, uh, Indigenous knowledge may have been thought of simply as Indigenous data. Uh, simply a collection of observations and data points uh, from an Indigenous source. But lately there is growing recognition of Indigenous knowledge as a standalone way of knowing an independent scientific process. Add it all up and there are a lot of folks in Environment Canada looking for guidance on working with Indigenous knowledge. Okay, um, <clears throat> so um, like I mentioned, uh, Acts have included Indigenous knowledge uh, going uh, nearly 20 years ago. Uh, the Species at Risk Act and the Mackenzie Valley Resource Management Act included those uh, concepts. So that triggered a lot of discussions about what the Indigenous knowledge is and Aboriginal traditional knowledge. Um, and five years ago, uh, a draft was uh, completed, uh, not circulated, but uh, uh, represented the start of um, trying to provide guidance on this area. Uh, a number of uh, internal and external engagement uh, processes were held and uh, most recently the Assembly of First Nations <clears throat> uh, produced a document for Environment Canada on exactly what it is that Environment Canada needs to know about Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous people. Next slide. Okay, so uh, what have we heard? Um, okay, so one of the main messages uh, was regarding the implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Um, in doing so, um, human rights, uh, inherent rights, treaty rights, Aboriginal rights are recognized. So that message was one of the uh, primary ones from Indigenous partners. They also identified a number of other messages. Um, they mentioned uh, that Indigenous knowledge is a separate, uh, different kind of science, equally valid, uh, but because of its difference, uh, IK cannot be integrated into Western science. Um, partnerships uh, need to be uh, based on a true and respectful uh, partnership and collaboration. <clears throat> Often the Turo Wampum concept is referenced as a model for uh, the type of partnership. Uh, communication should be uh, clear and respectful <clears throat> and that um, uh, processes should be uh, clear and consistent, uh, including uh, processes for handling of uh, confidential knowledge for data management 
and for uh, ownership issues of uh, knowledge. And of course, uh, support uh, for capacity um, so that uh, groups can participate in ECCC programs and activities. <clears throat> and um, Indigenous partners mentioned that support should be long-term, should be sustainable, uh, yet flexible, <clears throat> flexible enough to um, deal with the uh, types of demands that uh, communities require. Next slide. Okay, so internal engagement, what have we heard? Um, internally, okay. So uh, what have we heard? Um, so uh, basically two categories, uh, individually, um, there is a need for guidance and consistency in how uh, officials uh, identify and adhere to existing relationships and protocols uh, for guidance on uh, how to engage Indigenous people um, when they're kind of being told by some sort of mandate, um, how to respect Indigenous people's ownership and control of Indigenous knowledge, how exactly to co-apply or interpret um, uh, uh, IK in various projects and how to preserve the integrity of Indigenous knowledge. Organiz organizationally, uh, we heard that uh, Indigenous awareness and intercultural competency training uh, remains a priority and should continue, uh, that is in fact continuing, and that uh, training on how to respect and include Indigenous knowledge um, should be uh, um, something for the department to sort out um, because Indigenous employees like myself uh, can help uh, in these processes internally, uh, efforts to continue uh, with support uh, for recruitment and retention, and also that uh, a uh, financial processes and instruments need to be uh, clear and flexible and accessible and work for the purposes of Indigenous knowledge. Okay, uh, what we heard. Um, so just a preliminary analysis of what we heard. So again, in consulting with uh, folks internally and externally, uh, there appears to be um, four basic pillars on which a collaborative relationship involving Indigenous knowledge uh, is based. Um, so these pillars are not uh, a checklist. They're, they're more of a action-oriented uh, type list. So the four of them are to, uh, one, be engaging in the relationship. So knowing the uh, community, understanding the history, understanding uh, the legacy of the history and so on. Uh, number two, uh, implementation of the project. So that is uh, sharing in equity, providing capacity, uh, adequate uh, financial support and so on. Uh, number three, um, receiving indigenous knowledge appropriately. And so uh, what we've, uh, what seems to work is that when um, Environment Canada understands uh, the concepts of um, indigenous knowledge that is shared, that they handle appropriately, and that context is maintained um, uh, is uh, productive. And lastly, um, bringing knowledge together in situations where things um, have gone well, it's, um, it's uh, seen that uh, maintaining dialogue, uh, striving for consensus, uh, being respectful of the uh, knowledge systems uh, are keys to uh, a collaborative relationship. Uh, we will, of course, flesh this out more as the uh, framework uh, continues in its development. Next slide. Uh, there are key elements uh, remaining to address. So uh, roughly, um, these are prioritized. And so a lot of folks are asking about um, uh, kind of a, a collection of issues that, that maybe aren't, aren't clearly defined and sorted out. Uh, the issue of free prior informed consent um, in the context of applying Indigenous knowledge the ownership, access, and control of that knowledge. And so um, we, uh, in our group, we will continue to engage on uh, FPIC and related uh, matter of uh, consent. Um, it comes up a lot, mainly from a legal pers uh, perspective, but uh, starting from a legal um, uh, basis, uh, consent seems to have evolved from the idea of partnership and consensus to uh, get to a uh, permission. 
So in a consensus process, individuals are asked, can we all live with uh, the path forward or is there balance, uh, a balanced approach moving forward? Uh, this suggests that uh, con consent, uh, conceptually at least, uh, is different from a veto. And again, this is a key area that we will uh, flesh out further uh, before the document, uh, the guidance document is released. Um, another key element is the protection of Indigenous knowledge. Uh, work remains on that, uh, as well as um, uh, providing guidance on how to uh, bring knowledge systems together. Um, some people like to say braiding knowledge systems um, and ensuring that courses are inclusive, inclusive of uh, the different roles that exist in Indigenous communities uh, and so on. Uh, next slide. So uh, just a preliminary uh, outline of our framework. Uh, basically, uh, we'll go through um, for folks uh, who may not be familiar and importance of Indigenous knowledge and um, <clears throat> um, how we got there, some of the uh, Indigenous approaches like two or one of them. Uh, and uh, uh, dish with one spoon concept uh, was mentioned earlier. Um, a description of Indigenous knowledge, uh, uh, as mentioned, there are, are a variety of uh, ways to do that. So we will provide examples of the way different uh, um, nations across the country uh, describe it. We'll provide the contextual background, uh, some of the history and so on, um, treaty obligations, etc. cetera, um, as well uh, evolving principles uh, that uh, we have uh, are, are drafting. Uh, I'll show you those on the next slide. Uh, so you can, uh, we'll have a, a look at that. Uh, as well, we're continuing um, on detailed guidance on those uh, key elements. Um, we are trying to frame our document as not so much as a, a checklist uh, as a, um, that people can like, you know, uh, give a, a blueprint for, but we're, we're maintaining the image that this is a framework that uh, we, we will provide tools and the process will unfold as uh, what works with the Indigenous community. So, uh, and for uh, a lot of folks who are asking, well, what does this look like when um, Indigenous knowledge is um, appropriately worked with uh, in communities, we will provide case studies. And certainly there are a number of those uh, that have emerged um, and still need to be uh, documented. Next slide. Um, so as mentioned, uh, we have some uh, draft principles uh, we've developed for working with Indigenous knowledge. So we will advise that uh, ECCC officials should uh, value and respect uh, IK, and that means understanding the people from which it originates, uh, their worldviews, perspectives, and so on. Uh, secondly, East Triple C officials should uh, respect uh, the relationship uh, of the Indigenous group, whether that be nation to nation, um, government to government, or Inuit Crown relationship. So knowing the histories and how those uh, agreements uh, uh, came about. Thirdly, uh, EEEC officials should commit to meaningful engagement and a collaborative partnership. And that's uh, more than using um, historical Environment Canada approaches, but to use the uh, concepts and approaches familiar with the uh, communities. <clears throat> and uh, lastly, the uh, ECC officials should uh, respect uh, the protocols, uh, the policies and practices of the community. Um, um, in behavior, what that means is to uh, understand that protocols absolutely matter and that uh, if they're not available to find them and uh, importantly to use them. Okay, next slide. So I know we're getting a little short on time. Oops, I jumped ahead too much. Just uh, hold off on that for a second. I don't know how to go back. I think uh, if you click on the back button, just let's try that. the back arrow. It uh, should go back. back. Uh, how about control back? Go back, uh, shift back. Okay, let's have a page up. No. Okay. So, uh, Neil, if you wiggle your mouse oh. on the bottom left, there's a little tiny back button. There you go. Okay, I think I got it. Okay. Um, so, uh, this is going to be short. Basically, I just want to provide um, this image and um, 
<clears throat> on sort of detailed guidance uh, that people are looking for uh, in the department. And what's uh, noteworthy about this diagram is that, um, again, in the, in, uh, in the recent past, perhaps Environment Canada uh, may have demonstrated this sort of approach in a linear process. It may have begun with organizational planning or preliminary analysis and uh, in a straight line went to completion at disposing of indigenous knowledge records and some sort of evaluation. The approach now is that it's a circular nat in nature to represent the um, uh, ongoing uh, collaborative uh, process that Environment Canada approach on working with Indigenous people. And the blue uh, boxes are about the types of guidance that we will provide in our document. And now I can continue with the next slide, which um, uh, provides my name um, and my email address. Again, uh, comments, uh, questions are welcome. Um, so uh, myself and our team are looking forward uh, to hearing from you. And uh, that brings, you, brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you all for attending. Uh, and uh, over to you, uh, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. That was great, McGwitch. Um, I'm encouraging everyone to add your questions to the Q&A list. We've got quite a few, so I'm not sure we'll be able to get through everyone's, but um, we have, like Neil just shared, contact information. Uh, and in our future uh, series, you know, the future talks, uh, we can also get into some of these discussions as well. But I'll start off with one of my own questions here for both of you. And there's so many different Indigenous communities in this Great Lakes Basin uh, writ large. There's also different knowledges within each community. There's different knowledges that families might have or clans might have, et cetera. You know, how do you balance that, um, all of those different knowledge systems with the work that's trying to happen at sort of a national or international, you know, between the United States and Canada level? Um, I'll, I'll uh, take a try at that one. So um, <clears throat> thank you, Michael, for that question. Uh, Excellent question. Um, it does come up. How do you balance all of the input that's received? Um, and, and I think uh, one of the uh, concepts that um, Environment Canada is uh, hearing more about is the issue of ethical space. And so in the ethical space um, uh, approach, um, consideration is given to all of the input. It's uh, input is welcome, it's shared and it's given equal weight to uh, Western science or other knowledge systems. So um, uh, it's not necessarily about someone having the power to uh, overrule the rest of the group. It's about sharing of information and coming to an agreement uh, based on consensus if possible and seeing what works uh, for, for the group that people can all live with. So I think I would expand that out just a little. Um, when it comes to even being able to access that broad range of knowledge or um, approach individuals, so much of bridging indigenous knowledge systems and Western knowledge systems within these frameworks is a relationship, an ongoing trusting um, relationship. And I, I think that many of the governments, not just the federal, but the state, the provincial, the local governments are, um, and the tribal and First Nation governments, they're behind in developing a trusting relationship. Um, and so I think a lot of what happens right now is, you know, they're accessing the indigenous knowledges that have already been, I don't want to, <sighs> I don't want to, but I'm going to use the word synthesized, you know, developed already into management plans or, you know, publicly available documents. Um, and so, you know, we have Glyphwick, one of the examples that I skipped over was the tribal adaptation man menu for climate change. And it is something that was developed using knowledges from Ojibwe and the Menominee. Um, but it was pur purposefully made adaptable for other knowledge systems to be input into. Um, and I think that's one of the directions that maybe this needs to go, so. 
Yeah, that's great. And I don't know if someone can find a link to that adaptation, tribal adaptation menu, um, but that's a good one to share with everyone if you haven't seen it. Um, Okay, so now I'm going to start reading through some of the questions. Uh, here's one. Uh, it says, what are your recommendations for building capacity for directing and implementing environmental policy in Indigenous communities that may have TEK, uh, but not the resources to engage? Jen, I went first last time. <laughs> but you're the governmental. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Um, I, I have a hard time answering that. We have here within the United States, over the past several years, um, we have had the benefit of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, which is, provides capacity funding, um, which now can be utilized for engaging in these Great Lakes initiatives. Um, <clears throat> only the Great Lakes initiatives, but in Great Lakes initiatives. Um, that has had to undergo, go through a lot of development and improvement over the last several years to make it accessible for engagement, even though that's what it's for. Um, and so I would just recommend researching what initiatives, what programs are out there. Um, US federal agencies are constantly sending out requests for proposals for engaging in various um, projects, but they might be sent to very fairly limited audiences. And so I think it just takes a pretty steady run through to try to find the funding to engage. Um, again, uh, difficult um, question to answer. Um, capacity development, um, I, I think, is a matter of um, priorities. So I'm not at liberty to uh, say, hey, please accept uh, my priorities uh, for these and these reasons. Uh, understandable that uh, government has a um, number of different priorities to, to address. But uh, practically speaking, I, I agree, uh, as Jen was saying, uh, find where um, resources exist uh, and use them to their maximum. Um, and I, I would add, um, as best as possible, um, maintain relationships with your government contacts. Um, let them know that there are good things happening uh, in your communities that there are good things uh, with potential, provided uh, a bit of uh, a bit of funding, a bit of uh, long-term funding, and so on. So um, uh, maintaining relationships uh, both works both ways. So uh, continuing the dialogue with uh, government representatives. Great, thank you. I keep looking to the side because I have my second monitor, and that's where all the questions are. Um, popping up for me. So he, here's one, and I, I think I'm interpreting this correctly. And as a forester, somebody that works sort of upland, um, this this one I I can relate to. So it says, how are the Great Lakes watershed impacts captured and managed within the Great Lakes programs, including the TEK, TEK task force? So many of the impacts associated with the quantity and quality of water are related to the upland watershed and catchment impacts and land use change. So how I think, how, how is this connected within the water and sort of the upland ecosystems? How is this all coming together? Um, that one, I, I, I'm not familiar with the watershed ecosystem uh, planning uh, that uh, my colleagues at Environment Canada do. Um, but uh, what I would say is um, uh, stay in touch with your Environment Canada colleagues, uh, Fisheries and Oceans, and remind them that uh, you are uh, willing to participate in, in whatever processes about the management of those um, uh, tributaries, lake streams, inputs, uh, all sorts of things into the Great Lakes. I'm probably going to get myself in trouble here. Um, so how the uplands play a role 
in all of the management systems in the Great Lakes depends very much on the personality of the people in charge of the federal agencies at that moment. Um, we had se several friendly disagreements. Um, you know, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement was updated in 2012 and it kind of required a restructuring of a lot of the programs being run under it. And we had a lot of friendly disagreements in the beginning about the boundaries of the program and was it at the watershed, was it two kilometers in because yes, it was Canada <laughs> who made it, who defined it um, or, but we have slowly been working our way into expanding the boundaries of the various Great Lakes programs to include as much of the uplands as we can get away with. Um, you know, we ensure that any management documents or planning documents prioritize, you know, the uplands and, you know, up, the quality of the water is only as good as the quality of the ecosystems in the uplands. It will never be better. And so we just, in every opportunity, we stress the importance and the priority that should be placed on the uplands. And we've slowly managed to kind of push the boundaries back, but again, it's up to the personalities in charge at that moment, unfortunately. Great, I was gonna, there was a, a, a general question about the difference sort of between traditional ecological knowledge and Western I would say ecological knowledge. Um, and the, the question really is, are, do you have, where should people go to learn sort of about these differences? Are there definitions of these things? Um, how can, do you have links that you could provide that would kind of compare or, or resources for people to read, that kind of thing? Um, there are a lot of resources uh, out there and by out there, I mean publicly available, uh, various websites and so on. Um, I, we, uh, internally within Environment Canada, we will provide links in our framework to help with the understanding by our employees. Publicly, uh, I would say um, start with um, uh, resources that originate from uh, in Indigenous groups. Um, they will uh, may have, depending on their capacity, they may have resources available that describe these things. Uh, and there are uh, a number of public um, processes that have been put online that say, okay, in response to a government process, this, here is the indigenous uh, community or nation or region's response. So there are a number of resources available out there. Um, so dig around and, certainly ask questions. Uh, if you are um, able to reach out to Indigenous uh, colleagues or, or groups, then um, uh, do so. So the, um, the TEK guidance document has a pretty comprehensive list um, in one of its appendices. And I would also dig into the International Joint Commission. They are starting to undertake quite a few initiatives on TEK and how to um, bridge TEK and um, Western knowledge systems. I'm trying to think if there was anything online recently, but yeah, I would just dig through their website. They had a symposium just, or a gathering, middle of April um, that they have online that would provide some resources as well. It's It's become a, very well, it's increasing in its um, existence online and they're great YouTube um, videos that I've officially established myself as old since I couldn't run my slideshow. Um, YouTube is something I'd never really accessed before and I just stumbled upon it recently and it was, they have some amazing talks on there too, so. Yeah, great, that there's, there's wonderful scholarship too coming out of American Indian Studies um, where indigenous people are writing, um, writing about this topic as well. So I, I encourage folks to kind of Google around and, and uh, do that as well. And, and I'll echo Neil's comment about going to indigenous sources for this, this information. Um, okay, here I'll switch a little bit. 
Um, and, and here's a, a very short question, but it's, it might be big, I'm not sure. Um, how is this process occurring across urban governance? Urban governance. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what, what, what's meant by that. Governance in, in what area? Well, we could, I'll, I'll switch it up and say, how is this have, how are you integrating with sort of urban um, environmental management? Um, I will say, so, in my experience, we do not have much interaction with cities of any size <laughs> in um, our realm. But you know, I, I do know that in several Great Lakes water quality realms, um, there are a large number of representatives from community organizations that you know carry the same message that you know Glyphwick tries to carry with regard to um, its member tribes in terms of listening to the community, the community priorities, what issues are affecting them the most, in what way, and how to help them. Um, I I would say that. Uh, urban issues are not um, discarded. There are environmental issues that touch upon in um, urban uh, areas, um, uh, global warming, uh, contamination, um, species imbalance, um, species at risk. There are issues in urban settings uh, that require uh, attention and indigenous knowledge may provide um, understanding on how to uh, uh, how to deal with them. Um, but to my knowledge, I don't think there's anything specific. Uh, having said that, someone would probably correct me and say that there are, but I, I just don't know of any uh, at the time. But I, I, I will say it's not something that's uh, excluded. Great, thank you. There's a, a, a very specific question here. I'll just throw it out there because maybe Jen can answer this, but the question is from, um, it sounds like White Earth is not a part of these agreements. Oh no, I lost it all. It says, uh, I work on the White Earth Reservation. We are not included in the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Would we be able to apply the guidance to our region? I would hope, I mean, it, the guidance, you know, was created specifically for readers involved in um, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. But it's general enough that I certainly hope that by going through the, um, the examples provided, you know, it just kind of greases the wheels in terms of figuring out where, when, and how to begin the process of collaboration. So I hope so, yes, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. Um, a couple, we have a few more minutes here uh, before we wrap up. I'm going to paraphrase one of the questions, um, and hopefully, I'm doing it a little bit of justice. But in the, uh, but, so is is there any sort of danger or cautions you would have for sort of bringing traditional knowledge or indigenous knowledge, um, which includes a spirituality component, into these governmental processes? And, and how do you think about that? And I think maybe some of the recommendations, I think that Neil, you had on your thing um, and, and Jen as well with how to protect tribal data can cover it, but maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. Um, the uh, one uh, flag that comes to mind is that uh, as indigenous communities have let us know that um, the primary route to indigenous knowledge is through indigenous communities. If um, the communities themselves are best able to identify who the knowledge keepers are. So 
if you uh, find, uh, for example, like the, the, the wrong approach might be to say, okay, I've, I see this person's name, they did some study and oh, look, there's their email address. Their expertise may lie elsewhere. So that's an example of where it's best to go through the communities to find out from them who are the authorities of a given topic and not to reach people directly. So this is a topic that um, is being actively worked on and takes a lot. It's, and it's been voiced in so many different ways. Um, but one method that has occurred in practice with Glyphwick is, again, I'm using terms I'm not necessarily fond of, but like generalization. We um, will take the birch bark example. Um, our staff gets the information directly from um, the community members and then will generalize what they say into Western scientific um, data, basically, and use that to inform the research or direct the research. Um, <clears throat> you know, we will incorporate the values inherent in the TEK that is provided to us. Um, but keep out the specifics or the sensitive or, um, you know, we all, we go to great lengths to ensure that anything being entrusted to us is, remains with us to the degree that the knowledge holder wants and expects. Um, and it, so I, that's the terminology we'll, I'll use. We, we synthesize it, we generalize it, you know, we um, turn it into, we translate it into Western scientific data, basically, that can be used in the other processes um, when possible. Great, thank you. And then, so we have about one minute left, and I know Jessica wants to wrap up, but so in, a, in as short as possible, I'll ask both of you, what are your hopes for the future in this work? Uh, I'll 20 seconds. Okay, so uh, a concept uh, talked a lot about in Canada is the idea of two-eyed seeing. That is where uh, the best of Western science and uh, the best of indigenous knowledge is used to gain a greater understanding of a given environmental issue. And then both sciences are independently used and co-applied to get a better understanding uh, of the issue and to make uh, more informed decision-making. I'm... I'm really enthusiastic by the amount of attention that this has received over the past year or two, um, three, four, a decade, but you know, it's, it's really seemed to have gained steam in, um, you know, binational arenas. And it's my hope that it becomes just a general common sense understanding that different knowledge systems have equal place and, you know, in prioritizing developing or running through the analysis of the health of the Great Lakes um, and that it can be done eventually somewhat seamlessly. Chimi, which to both of you, and I'm, I'm gonna speak because not everyone can, can say thank you, but thank you so much for the presentation. We've gotten wonderful comments and I will turn it over to Jessica to sort of uh, take us out. Yeah, thank you to all of our speakers today, uh, Satyokwa, Jen, Neil, Mike, and also Jessica Dolan, who supported Q&A behind the scenes, Christina Martinez, who is with the University of Minnesota American Indian Studies Department running today's Zoom session, and Albany Jacobson Eckert with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, who assists with registration and outreach for the series. And thank you also to all of our attendees for today for your interest um, in the series and traditional knowledge and for participating in today's session. Our next session of the series, Braiding Ways of Knowing, TEK Theory, Methods and Ethics will occur on June 2nd and will feature a panel of indigenous scholars, including Deborah McGregor, Kelsey Leonard and Neil Patterson Jr. And at this time, we will conclude today's speaker series. Uh, miigwech, thank you for participating and have a good day. Thank you.